Glory to God. I want to welcome everyone to another one of our classes on Manifesting Sonship. We've been uh, studying this for some 17 hours now. 17 hours or 17 weeks of study on Manifesting Sonship. And during that time, we've spent or placed our emphasis on the fact that God wants us to grow up. We've looked in the scriptures over and over about how God wants us to grow up and, and the reasons for growing up and, and the things that people do to the believers that aren't grown, growing. I mean, that, that we're, we're prey to, to people that says, well, we'll read it in the, in the Amplified Bible this morning, but we're going to read a little further. And I'm believing that in this last three weeks of this course, we will be able to spend some time looking at how you grow up and what it means to grow up. We know now, we've established, I think, with plenty of scripture, the fact that God wants us to grow up. He wants that for us. And he wants it for us because there are a lot of blessings that we're able to appropriate and have manifested in our lives if we are willing to do the things necessary to grow in the knowledge of God, to grow in the wisdom of God, to grow up and to start to speak and to think like adult children of God. And so as we go through the scriptures this morning, I'm believing we're going to start to look at how you grow up and what it means to grow up. And I want to, to, to let you know from the beginning that the growing process, there is such a thing as growing pains. It's not necessarily easy, but it's worth it. Because all of the blessings that are attached to it. It's worth it for another reason too. We get to, as grown children of God, we start to manifest not only our sonship, but we start to be co-laborers with our Lord and Savior in the ministry that he was called to. And we will see the work that he does. We will see ourselves doing that same work also. And the work that he was doing was to accomplish and to fulfill the will of his Father. So Jesus was doing what our Heavenly Father wanted done, and now he's recruited us through his shed blood to come and join him in doing what our Heavenly Father wants done. That's Jesus' you know when he said, I only do what I see my Father doing, only say what I hear my Father say. And as we grow, it becomes more important to us to be about our Father's business. It gets to a place, according to the scriptures, that we realize that all our need is met according to his riches and glory. Our, our speaking changes, our thinking changes, and our actions change. Not because we have some program, no 12-step program, or three-step program, or two-step program. I, I like, as one of our pastors say, it's a one-step program. You just step right into Jesus, and you start doing the work that he's called us to do and he has equipped us to do. But he's only going to allow us to do this to the extent that we're mature enough to handle it and do it. And in this process, as we'll see, this, this how you mature and, and what you do if you're mature, I think you'll see some things that could change in your life for the better. Some thinking that would change in your life. So let's go to our scriptures. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4 and we'll start reading in uh, verse 11. <clears throat> it says, we're going to read this from the Amplified Bible. It says, his gifts were varied. He himself appointed, he himself appointed and gave men to us. 
his gifts were varied, he himself appointed and gave men to us. I always like to stop there because there is a belief in the church way too often that God gave men to the gifts. That God gave men to the ministry gifts. He did not give men to the ministry gift, gifts, to the pastors and the bishops and the apostles. And He gave the bishops and apostles and pastors as gifts to men, as gifts to the church. Those men, we that are called to ministry, you that are attending the school, that are, that are fulfilling the ministry that the Lord Jesus wants you to fulfill, you are a gift to the body of Christ. The body of Christ is not a gift to you. The sheep of his pastor are men and they're his sheep. I don't want you to get your thinking off to where you start thinking, oh, this is my flock. No, it's his flock. If you want to think of it this way, we're all sheep, even the gifts, and the pastor, someone like me, I'm the sheep with the bell on his neck. And I'm making the noise. And the idea is that the rest of the sheep will follow me as I follow the shepherd. And they know where I am because they can do what? They can hear me. But it's not that these sheep behind me are my sheep, they're the sheep belongs to the shepherd. In the scripture, like it's in the Old Testament, he said, the sheep of my flock are men. I believe that's in Ezekiel 24. But you can look it up. You're well equipped now to, through your Bible programs and the things that you have available to you, to research and look up, check out what I'm saying. Make sure what I'm saying is scriptural. So here we see that he gave gifts unto men. Some to be apostles, special messengers, some prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, some pastors, shepherds of his flock, his flock. Not my flock, his flock. And, and teachers. It's just in my spirit. So let's see if we can find that. I believe it's Ezekiel 24, 34. I haven't been there in so long. I might have to go to the index. Here it is, Ezekiel. the time I should have put my computer up here and I'd have it already. It's Ezekiel 34, not 24, Ezekiel 34. It says, And the Lord, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do not feed them, that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? This is what he wants the pastors to do. Feed the flock. Feed his sheep. Feed them. It says, you eat, the verse 3, you eat the fat and ye clothe you with wool. You kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. The diseased you have not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which was driven away, neither have ye sought that which was lost, but, the force, but with force and cruelty have ye ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. 
and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. See, that's where it's saying that if we don't grow up, when we look in, in uh, the book of Ephesians, that these men, we become the prey of unscrupulous men. If the ministry gifts do not do their job and feed and equip the sheep, there are those out there in the name of God that will do devastation to the body, members of the body of Christ. That's not what he wants. In fact, he has a strong admonition. We're not going to go through this. But I did want you to see <coughs> that <coughs> and drop down to verse 11. Well, verse 10, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock, neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. That's when the people are ripping off the church. It says, For I will deliver my flock from their mouth, and they will not be meat for them. And then in verse 11, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search, both search my sheep and seek them out, as a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all the places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and I will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers of all the inhabited places of the country. you to see this last part of this. And the 31st verse. I'd advise all of you that are going into ministry to read all of that. We're not going to go there now for the sake of time and go through all of the admonitions that are in here and God's promise to his sheep. But in verse 1, I want you to see that all the time he's been using this word sheep that he was talking about men. In verse 31 it says, And ye my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord. It's a lot of reasons why the Lord calls us his sheep. And one of the things that we've learned about sheep is they're defenseless. They're easy to kill, to slaughter. It's a lot of things about sheep. That's why the 23rd Psalm is so beautiful. When he says he leads them to green pastures because the sheep left to their own will graze and they'll eat the grass and then they'll start to eat the roots and the dirt and if they don't have a leader they can look at a green field next to where they're eating roots and dirt and they can look at it and unless someone leads them over there they won't go. <laughs> this is the sheep. Of, this is where the sheep become prey. So he set it up so that they would have pastors that actually care. Care for the sheep. Not just trying to feed off the sheep. Not just trying to rip them off for money. So when we go back here to Ephesians, now you'll see this is what this is referring to when he talks about us growing up. Yes? I'm always wondering, how do they say sheep have evolved when they, they can't do anything on their own? 
They don't do anything. You're right. They're, 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 they don't try to explain it. They try to confuse. That's what happens to they. They will read it here. Say they stay up at night, devising ways to get your money. That's what they. That's the way they feed on the sheep today. They want to get their money and they devise new ways and new schemes and they raise up followers after themselves rather than followers after the Lord. The shepherds are only to follow Christ knowing that the sheep are his flock. You hear the term in the church is talking about he's a sheep stealer. He stole my sheep. He came over here and got my flock. They're not my flock. They're not his flock. The flock belongs to the shepherd who is Jesus. They're the sheep. We are the sheep of his pasture. So when you, as you go into ministry, don't let anyone deceive you into thinking that the people owe you something. The only thing they owe you is to love you. The same thing that we owe to the people. It says, no, owe no man anything but to love them. You don't owe any allegiance or alliance. That's why we read, and I know it was in the past couple of weeks, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 where Paul says, who is Paul? He says, he says don't brag about having Paul himself or Peter or Apollos. Don't brag about having this man or that man as a leader says don't do that. Yes. He's warning the sheep, don't do that. So now the sheep have been warned, but the sheep are still sheep. You know what they'll do? They'll brag about having this one or that one as a leader until they grow up. This is why he wants us to grow up. We'll quit looking to the man and start looking to the man Christ Jesus. And that's why any pastor should say, don't follow me unless I'm following Christ. You're a fool if you follow me. Don't fall away. If I fall away, you just keep following Christ. You don't stop. There, there are people that have been devastated because the pastor did this or the pastor did that. The pastor is another sheep. He might have dropped his bell. Or even if he kept it on, if he's going the wrong way, you keep following the shepherd. You only follow the pastor as he follows Christ. You'll never go wrong. And you make sure you yourself, because even the ministers need a pastor. But their true leader is always has to be the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Lord Jesus isn't leading who you're following, you're going in the wrong direction. And if whoever you're following turns off to the left or to the right, and Jesus keeps going straight ahead, you just keep following Jesus. Don't even hesitate. Just keep going with Jesus, because you'll never end up in the wrong place. And this is the system that he set up. Satan is the one that devised all the rest of this, kiss my ring and all of this, bow and humble yourself before me, another man's. God didn't call us to do that. He said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. He never told us to humble ourselves under another man. We don't have to do that. Well, let's finish reading this in our scripture so we can get to what I said we were going to do and let's start talking about how we actually uh, start to grow up and what that process is like and, and, and what it will mean to us. So we were in verse, uh, <coughs> we read verse well, we were reading verse 11. And his gifts were varied. He himself appointed and gave men to us, some to be apostles, special messengers, some prophets, inspired preachers and expounders, some evangelists, preachers of the gospel, traveling missionaries, some pastors, shepherds of his flock, and teachers. His intention was the perfecting and full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people, that they should do the work of ministering toward building up Christ's body, the church. 
that it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the full accurate knowledge of the Son of God that we might arrive at really mature manhood, the completeness of personality which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection. The measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ and the completeness found in him. He is our standard. God wants us to grow to the fullness of the measure, the stature of Christ. What an awesome challenge. He wants you to be just like Jesus. And if it was not possible for us to be like Jesus, we would be following an unjust God. That means that God would have appointed men to try to do something that it was impossible to do, and that those men he would appoint would tell the people to do something that they couldn't possibly do. That would not be a just God. That would not be a good God. So he's telling us that he gave us some ministry gifts and those ministry gifts were to equip us and furnish us with the information, the knowledge, the abilities to use his word so that we could do the work that Jesus did no less than his standard of doing the work, no less than, than the fullness of the measure that he set up for us to follow. And that's his own perfection, his own maturity. What an awesome challenge. God wants me to be like, in our mind, our mind says, well, <laughs> there's no way I can be like Jesus. And that's where the maturing crumb comes in. Because he wants us to get out of our mind and utilize the mind of Christ. You ever wonder, why did he give us the mind of Christ? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you ever think, why did you give me the mind of Christ? What was I supposed to do with it? Utilize it. Use it. Well, how do I use the mind? Now we're starting to ask the right questions. How do I use it? How do I grow to the fullness of the measure of Christ? How do I do this, Father? Holy Spirit, teach me, lead me, guide me. Because now my heart has changed. My head didn't change first. Because my head cannot comprehend this. Not my human mind. This is something I need the mind of Christ for. To understand how to do the things that God has appointed me to do. He's called me to do something. I don't know how to do it. He says, yeah, but the Holy Spirit does. Now, if you utilize the mind of Christ, you're utilizing the Holy Spirit. And we'll see how this, we'll see how this works when we start, start looking into this process. Let's read just a little further. It says, verse 14, So then we may no longer be children, tossed like ships to and fro between chance gusts of teaching and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine, the prey, the what? the prey of the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men. Now, these unscrupulous men, are those people out in the street? No. They're in the church. Those people out in the street could care less about what we're doing in here right now. They're going about following their God, Mammon. It's the one in the church that are unscrupulous that would try to deceive and have deceived the body of Christ. So how do you know? Yes. How is it that a person could come to church and you think that they're listening to what the pastor is saying but not applying it to their own life? If people come to that, that's one of the things that's common. People come to church, they listen to the truth, they don't apply it to their life. But you know what they will do? They will follow the example of the leader. It's said in the church and in, in, in ministry, and it's been said for a long time, what's done in the pulpit in moderation will be done to excess in the pews. I mean, if I get up here and say, well, you know, I enjoy <coughs> a glass of wine with dinner every day. I might drink a glass of wine with dinner every day. 
But there are some, the people we're talking about, that are not following the word of God, that will hear me say, it's all right if you drank a fifth or two a night. What did I drink? A glass. What are some of them going to do? Drink a fifth. Drink a fifth. Drink, a, drink, drink to excess. So the people are more intent on following the leader than they are on following what the leader is saying. So even if the leader is saying the word of God, it's incumbent upon the teacher to live his life in a way that, according to the scriptures, that he will be an example. So hopefully some of the things like I tithe and I give offerings and my offering is greater than my tithe. I make sure that every year my offerings exceed 10% of my income because I want to be an example and I believe I have that from scripture that God didn't tithe Jesus to us. All he requires of us is a tithe. But his offerings, to me I see the heave offering, the wave offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the meal offering, I see all of these different offerings. What a great way to say thank you Father. To look like King David and to say like King David, Father, I haven't done anything. <laughs> when I give, you, give to you, I haven't done anything but return to you what was yours anyway. That's the example he wants us to be. And so that the sheep, if they follow our example and we're following Christ, we're following the word, then they will follow us more through what we do than what we say. So it's both a blessing and a curse involved in following the pastor if the pastor is not following Christ. You see how this works? So he, 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 he says that uh, he gives an, admon, um, an admonishment to the teachers that we have to give an account to him as to what we feed the flock. Why? Because the children of his pastor are men. They're not sheep, they're men. Now they act like sheep. That's why he uses the analogy of the sheep. They need a leader. So take away the leader, what happens? The flock is scattered. So he gave us the best leader that anyone could ever have, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to follow him. I asked you guys, follow me as I follow him. And where is this going? It's so wonderful when you see it in the Word. It is so wonderful. It's so freeing. When you first start, it seems like, well, that's so challenging. I could never do it. But the more you do it, the more you get engrossed in doing it even greater and even greater and even greater. Things start to, to, to pale in comparison to our Lord. I said things start to pale. You start to realize all of these things are mine, just like it says in 1 Corinthians. It says, let no man marvel in men, for all things are yours. So all these things are mine. The reason I don't have use to the access to all of these things is not because the things aren't mine. It's because my state of maturity doesn't allow me to access these things. In fact, there's a scripture in uh, Galatians chapter 5. Just turn there and we'll come right back. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, in the King James it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Let me read that and amplify it. Now what I mean is that as long as the inheritor, heir, that's us, is a child and under age, he does not differ from a slave, although he is master of all the estate. 
So all of this stuff is ours. But we go around as a slave as long as we're what? A child. We can't access it. We can't utilize it. But when we grow up, we will become master of our estate. Master number one of this estate that we have been given, that we're living in and going to exist in here. No longer will our bodies rule over us. No longer will the elements dictate to us. Why? Because we're no longer a slave. Now we're a ruler. Now you can see why Jesus could speak to bodies and have legs and arms grow out. Why he could raise the dead. All authority had been given unto him. He says, now I want you to grow up to the fullness of the measure of the statue of Christ and utilize the authority that I gave to him. And you command legs and arms to grow out. You raise the dead. You heal the sick. You, if you need money, send someone fishing and tell them to take the gold coins out of his mouth. You do those things that I did. Why? Because you're master of the whole estate. And when he says the whole estate, he's talking about this entire universe. We have some growing up to do, don't we? <laughs> Just to be able to accept the truth of what's being said in the Word. We say, I, I, this is way far beyond what the mind can comprehend. When you start understanding that you have started the process of growing up. When you get to the point where you realize, I can't do this with my mind. Now we need the mind of Christ. And we have to start to utilize the mind of Christ. We've got to do some things. And we're going to get into those things now. We're going to start in, uh, we're going to go back to Ephesians. We'll read just a little further and then we'll start talking about some of this process of growing up and what we have to do or what we're going to do as we grow up. Verse 14 again. So we may no longer be children tossed like ships to and fro between chance, gust of teaching, and wavering with every changing wind of doctrine. The prey of the cunning and cleverness of unscrupulous men, gamblers engaged in every shifting form of trickery and inventing errors to mislead. Verse 15, rather let our lives lovingly express truth in all things, speaking truly, dealing truly, living truly, and folded in love, let us grow up in every way and in all things into him who is the head, even Christ the Messiah the anointed one from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto edifying itself in love building itself up in love it says in the Amplified God is love <laughs> So if we're building ourselves up in love, guess what? We're building ourselves up in God. We're joint heirs. This is all talking about us. But now, <clears throat> let's look at one of the things that starts happening. And let's turn to, turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. It says, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So if becoming a man, you put away childish things, you stop talking like a child, stop thinking like a child, you stop acting like a child. So how does a mature Christian think? Now this is the part of growing up that starts to, 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 to be testy. It, it, it starts to challenge you. 
as you do it. But if your heart is right, what you'll do is press through. Remember Paul saying, I press toward the mark? He didn't say, I take a leisurely stroll. When you're pressing through, it's like pressing through a crowd of people. You're going to have to kind of maneuver, but you're going to keep, what, pressing on. Even though at times it might seem like you're stopped and you're looking for an opening and a way to proceed and a way to press on, a way to get through. The energy it takes to get through, too. You need the energy. You, you need to just look like, well, is there any, will I ever get through? Will I ever get through this? Yes, you will. You, as long as you keep pressing toward the mark. It becomes the most important thing to you. So turn to Philippians chapter 4. <clears throat> and verse 8. Well, we'll start reading in verse 6. It says, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. It's, it says, be careful for nothing. Don't worry about anything. So what are you worried about? You, you see, this is part of the, the, the process of, of, of growing up and manifesting your maturity. You see your mind when it's in worry, and it's in turmoil, you stop it. I'm not worrying about that. And you start to think differently, you, you start to speak differently. He said, he said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, but now that I'm a man, I no longer act, I no longer speak like that, I no longer think like a child. Well, well, well how does a, a, an adult believer believe? An adult believer, he, he has, uh, I'll give you an example, an adult believer has a child that's gone off. They, they, just say they just left the house for, to go to a party or to go someplace with their friends. And they know what time they're supposed to be home. And they don't come home on time. What do you do? You start to worry? Not according to this scripture. What do you do? You go to bed. Get yourself a good night's sleep. But before that, look, look at this, it says, be careful, verse 6, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God. Father, I want my children to be safe and I thank you for the ministering spirits that encamp about them, ensuring their path and their safety, blessing and protecting them, keeping them safe from all hurt, harm or danger. And I thank you, Father, for a peaceful night of sleep the sleep of the righteous and you go to sleep and if someone see this is where your 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 speaking changes if someone was to call you up say um, a friend uh, that their child was with your child and he says so-and-so isn't home uh, is so-and-so your child home? you say no you say well uh, what are you doing you say I'm sleeping they say well aren't you worried and you say no well don't you care you say no you don't care? That's, that, does that sound right to, to, to the not normal way of thinking for a person to say they don't care what their child is and what's going on with them? Yes? I ignore dangers that I don't call. Just plain and ordinary things. I ignore it. And a lot of people think I'm being extremely foolish. I've never had a problem. Well, see, the, the ignore, you say you ignore things like that. Yes, you ignore them, but you do it in a mature way by casting the care on him. If he cares for you, does he care for your children? Okay. Now, if you're going to cast the care on him, why are you worried? See, it says supplication of thanksgiving with thank Father. I thank you. They're in your hands. 
I thank you for those ministering spirits, those angels that I charge to encamp about my children, blessing and protecting them, keeping them safe from all hurt, harm, or danger. And I thank you for it. They're telling you, you're commanding them. We've been given charge over the, the angels. They're to minister for us. That's what it says in the Word. See, now we're taking the Word and we're saying, I'm going to live this Word. I'm not going to be talking about what it's like being a believer. I'm going to live like a believer. I'm going to grow up and do what my father said. He said, casting, well, let's read it. Let's, let's read it. <coughs> How we should think. He said, <coughs> And the peace, verse 7, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. The what of God? The peace of God. Which passes what? All understanding. So you can't understand this with your head. You're starting to grow to a place where there are things that are going on in this world that I can't deal with with my mind. What do we say we're going to use? The mind of Christ. This passes my understanding. So, well, that your friend or your neighbor would say, well, well, why are you at such peace? I don't know. I just trust my God. Pastor, that's like when my mother passed. It was so hard, but God has given us the peace that passes all the He gives you peace. People actually ask the question, you guys didn't even cry at your mother's funeral. It's not that we didn't love our mother. We loved her. We loved her and loved her dearly. God has just given us the peace. He gave you the God peace? Even understand it. Yeah, you don't understand it. You, you have this belief that you're going to see your loved one again, that you're going to be together forever. You don't have to mourn. That's what the scripture says. We don't mourn like the world mourns. We don't do those things. Why? Because we grow in the knowledge and understanding of our Heavenly Father and of our Lord Jesus Christ. The lengths that he went to to show his love for us by sacrificing Jesus. This is what we do. We take his word. And it says, let's go on. It says, verse 7, it says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It keeps both your heart and your mind. Your mind doesn't understand it, but all of a sudden there's a peace in your mind. And in your heart, in your core, the center of your me, you know everything's going to be alright. No matter what happens, everything is going to be alright because I placed it in your hands, Father. You told me to cast the whole of my cares on you, so I do. And I know that you care for me. And I, that's why it says with thanksgiving. Thank you, Father. You don't know where that child is. You don't know what's going on with that child. That child doesn't need your worry. It, he, that child needs your prayer and your thanksgiving and the angels of God. And God having it in his hands rather than in yours. You don't even know where they are. You don't know what they're doing. Oh, there's so many people, I know myself included, that have been brought through so many trials and, and, and dangers because they had a praying parent. Someone was praying for them. When they didn't have enough sense to pray for themselves or to do what was right, someone was praying for them and standing in belief that God would care for them. Instead of worrying about, about as Job did, worrying about what was going to happen to his family and what was going to happen to his riches and worrying. And then he said, that that I feared the most, what? Has come upon me. That that we fear. So I'm not going to walk in fear. I'm going to walk in belief. Walk in love. I'm going to grow up. When my mind wants to do these things, I'm not going to let it. Let's read just a little further. It says, finally, brethren, what things, in verse 8, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You should underline that in your Bible. It says, think on these things. When I was a child, I thought as a child. Yes. Isn't that what we read? But now I no longer think as a child. Well, how do you think? Since 
you're the one that's leading me yeah. as you follow Christ how do you how should I think whatever thing is lovely yeah. whatever things are true whatever things are honest whatever things are pure whatever things are of a good report if there's any virtue if there's any praise I will think on those things so now when we're challenged this is why I said the challenge of growing up we've set our hearts we're gonna grow up now something happens and I start to worry no I'm not gonna worry what am I going to do I'm gonna open my mouth and say this is what I'm gonna think on I don't have to memorize this but I remember some of these things in here whatsoever things are true whatsoever things are lovely whatsoever things of a good report if there be any virtue if there be any praise I will think on those things and the Satan will try to bring the worry back to you again you say no whatever things are lovely, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things of a good report, not a report that something bad happened to my child, but whatsoever things are of a good report, I will think on those things. When someone starts to make you angry and you want to think of vengeance, no, I'm not going to think of vengeance. Whatso what are you going to do? You're going to open your mouth and say whatsoever thing, you're going to drive this through till you start to mature and you do what God says. He said, this is the way I want you to think. So now I know, how does a mature Christian think? He thinks on whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, he thinks on those things. So all of a sudden, my thinking is starting to change. I'm not going to let that <clears throat> spirit of anger rule in me to where I'm thinking vengeful thoughts. I'm not going to let my mind just think on anything it wants to think on. Now I'm in control of my mind. Once I start getting control of my mind, I can do what the scripture tells me to do over in Romans chapter 12. Let's go there. This is all part of this process of growing up. It, say, it says, he wants us to grow up. Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. It says, I beseech you, brethren. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for you. I want to read those both in the Amplified Bible. It says in Romans 12, chapter 12, verse 1, the Amplified Bible, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you, in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your body, your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, intelligent service and spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves. Prove for who? Yourself. yourselves not proving this for God God knows where we are and what we are in a state of our maturity we want to prove this for ourselves with what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you and what's good and perfect and acceptable in his sight for you is for you to be nothing less than the measure of the fullness of Christ says, well, <clears throat> present my body a living sacrifice. Present my body as a living dead thing. 
He said, this body, according to the scriptures that we've already studied and understood, understand this body is dead. But we still have attached with this body a carnal mind. And to live according to the carnal mind, it's not the carnal body is dead, but the carnal mind, it's not dead. So we can live to, by the dictates of our carnal mind, or we can renew our mind so that we'll live by the Word of God. So now when we start to live by the Word of God, we start to demonstrate the attributes of our Lord and our Savior. Jesus didn't worry about anything. He took his concerns to the Father. He prayed. And so here we see <coughs> that we have a way of proving the things which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for ourselves. And when he says, <coughs> be changed through the entire renewal of your mind, he's talking about a change that is so far from what it was. It's not a changing of the mind, it's, it's a renewal of the mind. It's something new. The, the best example, the, the word transformed here, is from the Greek word metamorphod, where we get our English word metamorphos, where there's a change from one type of being or species to another. And the greatest example that I like to use is that of a, of a worm and that turns into a monarch butterfly. The worm inches along on the ground. The monarch butterfly can fly from one continent to another. Fly over the ocean. One is inching along on the ground, has no perspective. Can't see but what's directly in front of them. The monarch is soaring from the sky, has a panoramic view, they can see things. This is what happens to us when we start to make this metamorphosis, we start to seeing things. Now one of the things I want to bring out is for that caterpillar to turn into that butterfly, he has to go through a stage where he's in a chrysalis, a cocoon. He's in a state where he's not a, no longer a caterpillar, and yet and still he's no longer, or not yet, a butterfly. He's in a state of change. And this change, which is taking place, and it will take place in us, <clears throat> is something that you have to grow into that you become no more a caterpillar, that you become no more a child. But when you start doing this, it's like you're encased in this chrysalis or in this cocoon because you, you know you don't want to think like you used to think. You also know you're not thinking like you want to think. You're somewhere caught in the, between this. And you're being pulled in both directions. And just like the butterfly has to break out of that chrysalis, he has to break out of that cocoon. He has to strengthen himself by trying to break free. I'm told if you cut it open to let them out, you kill him because it never grows. It never gains the strength it's gonna, make to, it's gonna need to fly across the ocean because you weakened him. You didn't let him go through what he has to go through. So as you see, as you're ministering to people and you see them going through this, you have to let them go through it. You can't stop them and tell them, go back to being like you were, sweetheart. Because they know something now that won't let them operate like they were operating, but they aren't mature enough yet to operate the way that God wants them to operate. And so you keep strengthening them by giving them the word and not doing it for them, but equipping them with the word that they need. You pray for your children. 
They come to you saying, Pastor, I need prayer. What do you need prayer for? Make them think, well, just pray. I'm not going to just pray with you. I want to know what we're praying about, what we're praying for, what we're going to set ourselves in agreement for. You're raising them up. You're growing them up. You start the prayer, and then I'll join in. You know what you want to pray for. Get them to where they're doing for themselves. One of the greatest testimonies to a maturing group or a congregation is when you ask them to say, how many in here need uh, uh, a prayer for sickness? And no one stands up. Why? They pray for their own health. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Some of them are embarrassed. But that's the way children are. They're embarrassed. They don't want to get in front of people. They don't want to do this. You still have to know the Lord will lead you. See, this is why this says, says that this is all done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you get out of your mind and you realize this passes your understanding, you realize when the scripture says, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard, neither has entered into the mind of man the things that God has prepared for us. If I haven't seen it with my eyes and my ears, through my senses is what it's saying, <clears throat> and it have not been conceived by the mind of any man, then I can't conceive with. Here we are right back again to that which passes understanding. If I can't conceive it with my mind, how am I going to know about it? How am I going to do it? It says, but his spirit, the Holy Spirit, has revealed these things unto us. The Holy Spirit will reveal it to you, what you need to do and, 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 and when you need to pray and who you need to pray for and who you don't need to pray for but you need to raise up to a point where they'll pray for themselves. What if you're not around when they get the chest pains? What if you, you're not around when their mate falls over? Are you equipping them to do this? This is what you want to do as a minister. For the full equipping of the church. That's what your ministry is called to do. And it's also called to quit when you're out of time. So we'll continue this in our next lesson in the name of Jesus.